Hello, my name is Dr. Ruth Williams, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Glaucoma Research Foundation's second annual Glaucoma Patient Summit. We would like to thank Allergan, our presenting sponsor, for their leadership support of this event, as well as all of our corporate sponsors who helped make today's summit possible. We now have Dr. Sean Lin, who will present an overview of glaucoma. Dr. Lin received his undergraduate degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and completed his medical school training at Tufts University School of Medicine. He completed his ophthalmology residency and glaucoma fellowship training at the University of California, San Francisco. He has previously been professor of clinical ophthalmology at UCSF, including director of the UCSF Glaucoma Service and at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. He is currently practicing at the Glaucoma Center of San Francisco. Please welcome Dr. Sean Lin. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you, Ruth, for inviting me to give this talk. Let's start off with a question from the audience. The question is, why do we measure the eye pressure and how does it affect my vision? Those are excellent questions. And let's start off with this uh, diagram of the eye here. And you can see that in the, the front of the eye is made up of the cornea, which is the window of the eye. Behind that is the iris, which gives our eye its color. Uh, behind that is the lens, which as we age forms a cataract. And the back of the eye is the retina. And the retina has the nervous tissue that actually joins together and forms the optic nerve, which goes back to our brain and tells us what we see. Now, the, what happens in glaucoma, here's a healthy eye situation on the left here with uh, normal production of fluid in the front that goes out in the front of the eye through the angle. And in glaucoma, in general, there's an elevation in the eye pressure being shown by red arrows here, causing damage to the optic nerve, and that leads to visual loss. Specifically, the cells that are damaged in glaucoma, and what you see here are the different layers of the retina shown in enlargement here. And the cells that are specifically lost in glaucoma are the blue cells here called the retinal ganglion cells. And so different parts of our retina will have death of those cells as a result of the high pressure. And those areas where you have cell loss are areas that you will uh, have loss of vision. And usually that starts in the peripheral vision, but as you will see, it can constrict and then cause loss of central vision as well, as well as all of your vision. So here's an example of that, where this is showing in the top panel, you see that you normally have a wide field of vision. And in the, in the intermediate stage, you will have loss of vision in your peripheral vision usually. And the end, you can have tunnel vision and complete loss of vision in glaucoma. We need to focus a little bit on the drainage angle of the eye because there's two forms of glaucoma. So it's important to understand the physiology of the eye. And the fluid is made here. This is a cutout of the front of the eye. And what you see is that the fluid is made by the ciliary body. It goes in front of the iris uh, through the pupil and goes out through this area we call the angle because it forms the corner of a triangle. And it needs to go through this area of the trabecular meshwork and ultimately out to Schlem's canal and back to the blood vessel system. In open angle glaucoma, as you see on the panel on the left, is a situation where the angle looks open and normal, but there is on molecular basis blockage of the outflow and therefore an elevation in pressure. In the closed angle situation, it's anatomically closed where the angle, the iris and the cornea come together in the area where the fluid goes out, and then you have blockage of that fluid uh, outflow and elevation in intraocular pressure. And sometimes that can happen in a very acute phenomenon and you have an acute angle closure attack, for example. Let's take another question from the audience. Who gets glaucoma? And what people are more at risk? These are excellent questions. And some of the risk factors for glaucoma, main risk factors are listed here. These include age over 60, uh, patients of African, Asian, and Hispanic descent have higher risk. If you have a family history of glaucoma, you have a higher risk for glaucoma. Those who are very nearsighted, such as myself, and those who are farsighted are also at higher risk. People who've had used steroids before at risk for steroid-related glaucoma. People of high eye pressures, that is in fact the uh, number one physiologic risk factor for glaucoma, having a high eye pressure. Those who have a thin cornea or have had an eye injury are also at higher risk for glaucoma. 
We'll take another question from the audience. I was born with glaucoma, but what are the other types of glaucoma? And what are some of the symptoms of glaucoma? Those are excellent questions as well. So let me first off start off by saying that the symptoms of glaucoma are usually, in fact, symptomless. That is, it's a disease that really is, doesn't give you symptoms of vision loss until the very end. So I think it's very important to get screened and followed for glaucoma rather than wait for the symptom. In fact, it's called the sneak thief of sight because you, you lose vision in your peripheral vision without even knowing it until it's almost too late. However, having said that, there are symptoms for very severe glaucoma where the pressure can, for example, be very high and or you've had uh, severe vision loss. And these include, of course, hazy vision. You can have eye or head pain if your pressure is very elevated. Uh, that can also cause nausea and vomiting as well. And the appearance of these rainbow colored halos around the eye. And you can also have sudden vision loss as in the case of the acute angle closure attack that I mentioned. Now, what are the causes of glaucoma? People, my patients often ask me, well, why did I get glaucoma? And the truth is it's, uh, it's probably mostly genetic. From what we know from studying the genetics and studying what are possible environmental factors, it's probably mostly genetic. There can be contributing factors such as being more nearsighted. Again, I'm a good example of that. Puts me at higher risk for glaucoma. There may be some other environmental reasons. One of the uh, reasons that has been uh, looked at recently is the role of stress. And some of the best indirect evidence for that is through studies showing that meditation actually can lower intraocular pressure and also influence factors that uh, may develop into glaucoma as well, enhance those factors. So that may be a possible contributor as well. There are many different types of glaucoma. The primary type of glaucoma, the number one type of glaucoma is what we call primary open angle glaucoma. And primary meaning that it is a disease in and of itself, not secondary to some other factors such as trauma. And within that category is normal tension glaucoma where the angle is open, but the pressure is in the normal range. And this is actually a large subset of glaucoma as we'll talk about in a little bit. The second most common form of glaucoma, which is actually very prominent worldwide, especially in Asia, is primary angle closure glaucoma where the angle, as I described, is actually closed off and can cause the pressure to be elevated and cause loss of vision. In fact, this type of glaucoma is actually much more devastating and much more aggressive. So it actually causes probably uh, the majority of the glaucoma blindness in Asian populations. Pseudo exfoliation is also a very common type of glaucoma in which white material is released in the eye and actually goes and clogs the area where the fluid goes out, causing the elevation in intraocular pressure. There's many other types of glaucoma as well. And I'll make a special mention about congenital glaucoma which is a form that the child is often born with or often develops soon after birth. And it's, a, again, a very devastating type because it's often very high pressure in the eye, causing the eye to have enlargement. Often the cornea will be white. And uh, since it affects the child at such an early age, again, much more devastating over the course of the patient's lifespan. A little special mention about normal tension glaucoma, which actually is not as rare as we once thought it was. It's a, again, a disease where you have glaucoma, even with the pressure in the normal range, usually toward the high normal range, the treatment's still the same. We still lower intraocular pressure, but it's a disease that's harder to pick up because you know pressure's in the normal range and the patient and the doctor may not be uh, as alert that this may you know, be a form of glaucoma in the patient. And so it's something that we have to be very vigilant against. And this is a disease that is much more common in certain populations. Uh, in the Asian populations in particular, there's a uh, much more prevalence of this disease, specifically in the Japanese and Korean population. It's their number one, by far their number one form of glaucoma. It accounts for about 80% of the glaucoma in these populations. And in the Chinese population, it's also about almost half of the glaucoma in the Chinese population where it's normal tension glaucoma. We'll take another question. Good morning. Um, I would like to ask, how do you test for a glaucoma? And what are visual fields and OCT tests? And how are these results interpreted? These are great questions about, you know, about the diagnosis of glaucoma and about following the progression of glaucoma, for example. So when we, the way we diagnose glaucoma is that we measure your intraocular pressure to see if it's elevated. We also uh, measure the, and also related to that, by the way, is measuring your corneal thickness because that's a modifier 
of the intraocular pressure and how we think of the intraocular pressure. So that's as part of standard of care is looking at what your corneal thickness is. The optic nerve exam as well and visual field testing. And finally, gonioscopy to determine if you have open or closed angle glaucoma. For the eye test, many of you have probably already had this. This is the gold standard for us in ophthalmology where we have a probe that gently comes and, and, and tests the pressure on the surface of the eye. And this is uh, our way of determining whether you have an are higher risk for elevated intraocular pressure and glaucoma. We also look at your optic nerve. It can be through this method or the slit lamp uh, where we assess your optic nerve and determine whether you have an optic nerve that's at risk for glaucoma. These are examples of the optic nerve uh, exam. And on the left, you see a healthy optic nerve and a healthy optic nerve is this circle here. And we want to see it filled with healthy, you know, healthy optic nerve tissue, which is orange in color. There's often a, um, a cup, which is more pale looking. And usually it's a very small proportion of the entire optic nerve, maybe up to 20% of the optic nerve area there. And so you see this person has a small cup, which is normal. What happens in glaucoma is that optic nerve tissue is squished, it's damaged, and you lose a lot of it, if not most of it. And on the right panel, you see an optic nerve that looks very pale. In fact, it's almost entirely a cup, and there's almost no optic nerve tissue. There is. It's very much very thin, and it's just at the very edge there. And so that's a nerve that has severe damage from glaucoma. A newer way or more modern way of assessing the optic nerve is with optical coherence tomography, otherwise known as OCT. So this has become almost basically a standard. And that's a laser scan of the optic nerve that actually tells us almost uh, microscopically how much nerve tissue you have and what your risk for glaucoma is and whether you're getting worse as well. Here are some printouts from the, the OCT exam. And on the left, you have somebody who's a glaucoma suspect. And I'm just gonna be very brief in sh showing you sort of what to look for when you see this printout for the OCT. In this healthy optic nerve on the left side, and this person is simply a suspect, uh, the, the right side, the right eye is, is described here on the left side of the page, and the left eye is actually described on the right portion of the page there. You wanna see uh, whether the quadrants and the different segments are labeled as green, green meaning you're in the normal range. If you're in the yellow range, that means you're borderline, and red means you're outside of the normal range. So what you see on the right in somebody who has glaucoma, and pretty significant glaucoma, is that you have these different quadrants and segments of the optic nerve, that specifically the retinal nerve fiber layer tissue, that is either in the red or the yellow range, and those signify areas of probable uh, nerve tissue loss, and you would expect to see perhaps some visual field loss associated with that. So here's the visual field testing. Probably all of you have done this. And this is the most cumbersome test that uh, our glaucoma patients have to take. And it's somewhere between as little as five minutes all the way up to maybe 20 minutes uh, per eye. And it's one where you have to click the button every time you see a light in the periphery. And this is a very critical test. It lets us know how much vision you've lost and also lets us monitor whether there's progression. Here are some examples. On the left, you see a normal visual field in which the person was able to basically hit the button every time they saw the peripheral uh, spots in their visual field. There's a dark spot there and that's normal. That's a physiologic blind spot, which basically all of, all of us have. On the right, you see somebody with pretty severe glaucoma and you see that those dark areas are areas that the patient could not see on the visual field testing. And you see that it's also peripheral as well. Most of us don't use our peripheral vision. That's why it's so stinky that you may lose a significant amount of peripheral vision and not know it until you get tested or unless it's too late, where it starts to encroach on your central vision. And the last test I'll talk to you about is gonioscopy. This is where a lens is placed on your eye after anesthetic, and it's used to assess whether the angle is open or closed, whether you have the open versus closed angle type of glaucoma. And I'll talk very briefly about treatment. Dr. Paul Singh will talk later uh, in more detail about treatments and including the, some of the newer treatments and newer surgeries, and these are very exciting. But I'll give you a, just a broad overview about what treatment's about. The only thing approved for treating glaucoma is to lower the intraocular pressure. And this can be either through medical treatment, that is usually eye drops, uh, and there are four or five classes of eye drops that we can choose from, or you may be on multiple classes. And also you can advance to doing laser or incisional surgery. 
In fact, often laser is now used as a first-line treatment because it is a very safe form of treatment for glaucoma. We hope in the future that we'll have medications that will protect the optic nerve, the field of neuroprotection, directly protect the optic nerve besides lowering the intraocular pressure. There are all alternatives for glaucoma treatment. My patients ask me often, what else can I do? You know, is there something besides using the uh, eye drops or getting laser? And so there are, there's a lot of investigation in these areas. They're, they are, I would say, not proven, but uh, there's some small studies usually providing some evidence that these may be helpful in glaucoma. And I'll just quickly run through just some, a brief list of a few of them. These include marijuana, ginkgo biloba is investigated significantly, especially in Asia is a possible benefit in glaucoma. Meditation, as we talked about before. Bilberry, which is a form of blueberry, has uh, several studies that suggest it may be helpful in glaucoma. And more recently, niacin has been shown to possibly prevent progression of glaucoma as well. So in summary, glaucoma is an irreversible disease. It's very important to be vigilant in screening for this and getting it detected early and getting it treated and following its progression because it's a silent disease. You can have this disease, not know it, and you can have progression of disease and not know it. And you really need to be under a doctor's care and doing these testing that we've talked about in order to really know whether you have the disease or you're getting worse. The only treatment we have for this disease is lowering the eye pressure, the only approved treatment we have. And we hope to have, of course, better treatments, including through the work of GRF. And in the end, the most important thing in your specific case is to talk to your doctor about your case and about the treatment plan that best works for you at your stage of glaucoma, uh, or maybe even just glaucoma suspicion, and make sure that all of your questions are answered. And I look forward to our discussion and any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. That was fantastic.